Uh, yeah, so I work on a software library called Dask, which is for parallel pr programming. And I, I give this talk a lot to a bunch of different audiences. And so I have a, a slide deck that I posted in the chat, uh, which has a bunch of different topics we can go through. And there's you know, hours of content here. We obviously don't have hours. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, sort of a brief high-level overview, a uh, couple of examples that maybe show a couple of different uh, types of how you might use Dask. I think maybe we'll then switch maybe a little bit of questions. We'll then switch to Alex, who I think has an actual, uh, he's been using it recently. Uh, and then we'll switch back to general questions. I guess we want to talk to, we can talk about a variety of topics. Uh, so again, I, I encourage I encourage involvement. Uh, also in the chat window, uh, there are a couple of links. One is the documentation. If I seem boring, you can feel free to go to read the docs. It's also a very small deployment on, uh, on some cloud system. If you want to play with things on a, a couple of cores, uh, so you can go and play with some of the examples. So. Again, my name is Matt, I work for Anaconda. Also with me is uh, Martin Durant, who also works for Anaconda, also on Dask. And Dask is a library for parallel programming in Python. Uh, so at like a super high level, uh, Dask uh, parallelizes libraries like Pandas, NumPy, and Scikit-learn. These are very popular libraries in the, the Python ecosystem, but it's also useful for parallelizing other systems as well. Uh, it scales from one multi-core machine uh, which is the most common case, to you know, hundreds of thousands of computers. This is uh, more sort of Spark-like scaling. It is not MPI-like scaling. So we're, we're not a simulation engine. We're mostly doing data analysis. Uh, differently from systems like MPI and Spark, uh, Dask, is bask, is Dask is backed by a flexible task scheduler. Uh, this is sort of like make or make files, uh, but very dynamic in real time. Uh, and that that flexibility allows us to handle uh, a lot of very complex and custom systems. And that's where Dask has been really uh, attractive for most people. Uh, it's made in Python. It's pure Python. So if you like Python, it's very convenient. Uh, if you're more a C or C++ developer, uh, it's very easy to interact between Python and C++, at least going from Python calling C++. Uh, I assume that this community is mostly a C or C++ community. Uh, so this, um, you know, this may be, may be, may be relevance. Uh, it's supported by community developers. Uh, I work for a for-profit company, uh, Anaconda, uh, Martin also, uh, but it's supported by a variety of different groups. We make money off of companies. The government pays a lot of grant money towards it, and a lot of open source developers contribute to it. So uh, let's talk about Dask at a high and a low level. So Dask was originally designed to paralyze the NumPy ND array. This is like a MATLAB array or just any multidimensional array that people can sort of operate at in, an, in a pleasant way. Uh, we then extended it to pandas, and then we went out to a variety of users and we said, hey, here's this parallel NumPy array, isn't that great? And in some cases it, it was great, and in some cases they had more complex situations. And so Dask sort of evolved to support more complex things, and we'll talk about that. So I want to give uh, first sort of a, a high level overview of sort of how some people interact with Dask, with parallel NumPy and parallel pandas. And then we'll go into sort of a more low level example uh, with uh, doing sort of more custom computations, parallelizing your own code, et cetera. And I'm not sure where this group lies in those two, two groups, in those two options. Okay. Uh, so uh, one way to use Dask is the Dask array module. And this is the original intent of Dask. And Dask array gives you uh, a parallel NumPy array so you can have many NumPy arrays that are all arranged into one logical larger array. These arrays might live on disk on a, a single laptop computer, or they may live you know, on a cluster in the memory of many different computers around that cluster. And Dask Array gives the same NumPy API. So, it's, so these lines up here are all NumPy based. These lines down here are all Dask Array based. And so the, it's mostly the same. There are a few small differences, like defining the trunk size. But it gives the same API, uh, and it uses NumPy under the hood. It's just coordinating many small NumPy computations. Similarly, there's Dask Data Frame. So this is very commonly useful in you know, finance situations, people who have large types of data sets. One Dask Data Frame is composed of many small Pandas data frames, uh, either, again, on disk, on a single computer, or spread across the memory of many different computers on a cluster. So in this case, you might consider having a time series 
you can't fit the entire time, time series in memory. Maybe you know, every computer holds on to one month of data. Again, DAS data frame is just one logical connection of all of those pandas data frames supporting the same API. So I'm going to give a quick example of this, uh, and then we'll jump into a more low-level example. Um, OK, so I'm sitting here on a cluster on uh, Google Cloud, and I have access to a bunch of CSV files. Uh, so this is the New York City taxicab data set. It's a bunch of CSV files that contain uh, the record of every cab, every taxi ride that happened in the, in the city of New York. Uh, it's too much data to load with pandas, but I can load a little bit of data uh, with, with pandas read CSV. And we see things like you know, the, the time the cab picked up, when it dropped off, number of passengers, location, and a, and a breakdown of the fare. How much was the tip? How much was the tax, et cetera? Uh, so I can't list all into memory. It's, it's too large. Uh, but I do have access to a cluster nearby. So I'm going to ask for maybe 20 sort of two-core machines. And that's going to give me also this dashboard on the right. So this dashboard is showing me a few things, it's showing me you know, all the workers I have present. You've got you know, four workers. It looks like maybe I actually don't have enough nodes on the cluster. I suspect that Google is now spinning up some more machines for me. So this might take a moment for that to, uh, for that to fully realize. Um, and so now rather than calling pandas read CSV, I can call das data frame read CSV. And what this does is breaking up all of that large data set into hundreds of small pandas data frames. And we're seeing here on the right what all of my uh, cores and all of my clusters is doing. So if you don't care about pandas, that's, that's fine. Mostly I want you to understand that this is breaking up large computation into several smaller ones, and then running them on distributed hardware. So every line here on this plot we're seeing uh, the activity of one core, one thread of my cluster. Again, it's sort of small at the moment. Uh, and we're seeing that they you know, reading blocks of bytes, takes about a second or two, and we're, we're parsing some of those bytes into pandas data frames, reading some more bytes, et cetera. And so this is creating you know, hundreds of small pandas data frame objects in my many Python processes across my cluster. What that gives us back is sort of a normal uh, not a, it doesn't give us a pandas data frame. This is back a DAS data frame. And this gives us you know, the nice ability to do uh, general pandas operations. Looks and feels the same. It's, it's fine. Uh, I actually am a little bit uh, sad right now because I was hoping for this to quickly scale up. Uh, I wonder if someone else is using the cluster. But this might be a good opportunity, actually to instead talk about Dask Array. Okay, this will be a bit smaller, and I'll just, I think we can get by with four machines. So similarly, I can create a Dask array of a certain, you know, maybe a 10,000 by 10,000 array, and that creates a bunch of NumPy arrays spread around the cluster. Right, so we have here now just a bunch of NumPy arrays sitting in RAM, and we can do things with them. We can do simple computations, and that will cr uh, cause Dask to run through a bunch of computations for us. So two things happened here. Uh, one, the Dask array library translated you know, some, some high-level syntax into many small Python calls. And then at a lower level, uh, uh, the Dask library executed that task graph for us. It created, it ran all those computations on parallel hardware. Here you're seeing computations like add and computing the mean. You're also seeing, seeing data transfer. Uh, so the red is moving data between various, various parts of the computation. That is all stored as a task graph inside of Dask. Uh, and so you know, each box here corresponds to one NumPy array, and each line corresponds to you know, some function that had to be called that required a variety of different NumPy arrays. So uh, Dask works well. It scales on a cluster. It gives high-level Python APIs. 
However, my guess is that most people in this meeting don't care that much about high-level Python APIs. My guess is that you're looking to parallelize your own custom code. Uh, so for that, I'm going to switch to a different example. Uh, and I'm going to do that also on my laptop. So uh, again, we went to many people with, uh, with this big data frame, with this big array. And some groups, you know, large finance groups, they said, this is great, this is not what we need, we just wanted a bigger pandas, thank you so much. Uh, other groups uh, said, you know, I actually really like the, the scalability, but my problem does not fit into a big NumPy or a big pandas data frame array. Um, and so they might have code like this. Uh, so we're iterating over a couple of, of lists. We're calling some function f or g based on some condition. And this is very clearly parallelizable. There's many independent calls here that don't depend on each other. Uh, but it's not clear how to turn this into a big NumPy computation. It's, it's somewhat different. I've got a bunch of generic Python code I want to parallelize. Uh, so there are other APIs in Dask that allow you to generate those same task graphs and then execute them on those same task schedulers on those same clusters. So uh, one of the reasons people, many, people like Dask is it allows them to build their own parallel systems. And again, I suspect that this group might be in that, in that community. So I'm going to go through another example, this time on my laptop, and we'll actually set up a cluster by hand just to see what that looks like. So I'd be of interest to people who do more IT. Um, so uh, here is some generic Python code. I've got some functions, increment, decrement, and add. It's just normal Python. I can run it sequentially. So these functions uh, sleep for a random amount of time and then return some slightly modified result. Inc adds one, decrement subtracts one, add adds two numbers. So those will run for, you know, here 1.4 seconds. Here it might run for 1.5 seconds. Now I would like to parallelize this code. Both of these calls can happen independently. And then this one depends on both of them. I'm going to parallelize that using uh, Dask delayed. This is a, a relatively simple way to parallelize existing code uh, to have it run um, lazily. So now my increment function is now a modified version of my previous increment function. So now when I call that increment, it's not going to execute that function immediately as Python would normally do. It's now going to place that into a task graph. This is a fairly typical approach to in dynamic languages to turn um, you know, sequential looking code into uh, lazily constructed uh, graphs, then code functions that need to run, data they produce, and then uh, dependencies between that data and future functions. So now, rather than computing that in a single thread, we can compute that with a local thread pool. And in that case, a lot faster, but you know, in general, it's going to be modestly faster. Increment and decrement can run at the same time. Uh, notice I haven't set up a cluster here. This is actually running just on my local machine. Um, so this is, uh, Dask is very, very lightweight. Many people use it without talking to Google, without talking to a cloud resource, without talking to a, a you know, high performance computer. Uh, by default, it runs just in threads or in processes locally in your machine. Uh, however, it's interesting to see how one sets up Dask. So I'm going to do that here. Uh, so on one machine, uh, we, we create a scheduler. This is, you know, some people might call this the, the central or the master node. And on other machines, we're going to create Dask worker processes uh, and point them to uh, wherever the scheduler was running. Here, it's just on my local machine. So uh, there are a variety of, of utility ways to do this on a variety of different clusters and job schedulers, you know, Slurm, PBS, Google Cloud, AWS, et cetera. But it's sort of nice to see what's actually happening. Uh, when you switch to using a cluster, there's one central process that's coordinating everything. And then there are a variety of worker processes that can be created to do the actual processing. Back in my Python process, I'm now going to connect to that same cluster we've created. And that will bring up uh, also, let's this down. That will also bring up the dashboard we saw before on the cluster. So let's go and look at that. So now when I call that same computation, uh, previously running in threads, but now we're connected to a cluster, it'll run uh, in parallel on that cluster. So we see it, it ran increment and decrement at the same time in parallel. And those took, you know, a few hundred milliseconds. 
and then transferred you know, one of those results to the other. That took, looks like, you know, three milliseconds. Then it called add, again, another few hundred milliseconds. So it's allowed to see sort of the parallelism that we're, we're uh, computing. So um, that was a very small computation, something bigger. Uh, here we're just, you know, we're looping over a, a list and we're computing increments and decrements and adds on that list of, of elements. And we're, you know, nicely using our, our parallel resources. Uh, let's say that was going a little bit slower than we wanted to. We can also start up new workers. You know, again, I'm doing this on my local machine, but ideally you'd be doing this on some sort of cluster. And so now we're getting, you know, uh, more, more parallelism. Uh, so where this becomes valuable is when you, when you want to make uh, more complex computations. So, you know, many, you know, this is a relatively simple computation. It's, it's embarrassingly parallel. And maybe this is appropriate for what you guys want to do. This is a very common case. But let's consider a more complex situation. Maybe you have now all of these numbers spread around your cluster and you want to add them together. You could move them all to one machine and then add them there. Uh, or you might consider uh, adding them pairwise in a, in a tree reduction. So here I'm adding, going to add uh, every pair of numbers, get a new, get a new number, so I have half as many numbers. I might add those together in pairs and again have half as many and keep doing that while I have uh, any computations left. Um, so I've written down that algorithm in a few lines of code here. This isn't uh, immediately understandable, but it's also not that hard. Someone with modest programming experience can write down this somewhat complex tree reduction algorithm. And it looks like normal Python. And we can see that run over here on the right. And you can see there's a lot of ads. There's some communication in the red. And then towards the end of the computation, you actually see some of the tree structure almost come out as there's less and less parallelism as you get to the top of the tree. Uh, so maybe it's fun to see that actually as we uh, watch the task graph view. So you can, again, you can see Dask uh, execute all those computations in parallel. You can see the dependencies. This is what Dask does under the hood. It runs stuff in parallel and allows you to define that graph in a variety of ways, either using systems like Dask Array or Dask Data Frame for more uh, typical algorithms, or systems like Dask Delayed if you want to build your own system. Uh, okay, so those are my two sort of basic demonstrations, and hopefully they give you a good idea of the range of uses for Dask. Either uh, you really like the Python ecosystem, like NumPy and Pandas, and you want larger variants of those libraries, or you have your own custom Python code and you want to parallelize that. Uh, people tend to live in one of those two groups. Uh, I don't know exactly which group you guys are in. Uh, okay, so let's go back to slides for a moment. By the way, for our... Uh Informal discussion. Uh, people have been really quiet on the other side. Mm -hmm. Have there been any um, questions yet? Like something to guide the uh, the rest of this presentation? So, so I was wondering. I mean, we we're, we're primarily using uh, condo farms right now, mm -hmm. and I hope this is going to change. But is there a way to, I don't know, send a condo job uh, that connects then to the DASC? Yeah, actually, I um, I actually asked Jim before this meeting about uh, you know, what kind of things you guys use. He mentioned Condor, um, and actually, so many people use Dask today on not necessarily Condor, but other job schedulers like Condor, PBS, Slurm, mm -hmm. SGE, etc. Uh, and really, all you have to do is on one machine call Dask Scheduler, and on many other machines call Dask Worker, pointing it to that that machine. Mm -hmm. um, I would actually. Uh, I usually work, work on a Linux machine. I was trying to get SSH tunneling on this one. It wasn't working. But I was actually going to do the demonstration I did previously on such a system. Uh, there are a variety of tools. You might want to look uh, for uh, Dask Drama or Dask Job Queue. There are many tools out there that, that automate that process. Okay. And, um, and w one more question. Uh, when, when I have a scheduler and a couple of workers, can the scheduler be used by several different users? Uh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, so you can have many clients connect to the same cluster, and that's fine. Uh, you should expect all of the software environments to be the same. So everyone must have the same versions of libraries in that case. Okay. Uh, however, the scheduler doesn't do any kind of uh, user balancing. 
Uh, what I more often see in companies is when a user logs on, they quickly turn, off, turn on a scheduler, turn on many workers, use them for a little while. When they leave, they turn them off. Um, and uh, in, again, in sort of normal operation where these people do things, they do something like from dask, job queue, import, you know, PBS scheduler, mm -hmm. PBS cluster. They do cluster equals you know, PBS cluster. Maybe they give you know, some project ID, you know, uh, you know my account. Let's say cluster dot, you know, start workers. You know, 100 workers or something. Uh, and then that's it. And this, this goes off and generates the Condor scripts that you need to run and runs them on your cluster. When your session dies, it cleans everything up and it's, it's fine. Um, so it's it's generally pretty easy to run things on a cluster. Uh, I haven't built anything for we haven't built anything for Condor yet, uh, but it's it's trivial to do. So I wouldn't worry about that if that's something you're interested in. All right. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. Generally, it's easy to deploy Dask, uh, especially on more traditional clustering systems. Uh, Dask tends to be used by many scientific groups in atmospheric sciences, in genomics, in a bunch of different places. And they have historically preferred, uh, you know, supercomputing facilities, large academic clusters, et cetera. There's now movement to move to the cloud, but Dask supports both in nice ways. So I thought I'd end just with a sort of again, high level overview. Systems like Dask, DataFrame, and Dask Delayed author these task graphs where it's many individual Python functions creating Python objects. Um, and those Python objects may then refer to you know, C++ code or C++ objects or C code as you like. Uh, and then there's a separate part of Dask, which is executing that graph uh, in parallel in an efficient way, uh, keeping track of, you know, launching systems, data transfer, et cetera. And so there's really two parts of Dask, creating task graphs from a convenient Python API and then executing those graphs uh, on parallel hardware. Um, Switching schedulers, generally a network looks like this. There's one centralized scheduler that manages a few workers. Those workers communicate to each other in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, and clients uh, send work to the scheduler to manage on all of those workers. Uh, those functions you're running can be whatever functions you want. Uh, you do need to make sure that the software environment is the same on your machine and on all the workers. So if you have some C++ library, we're not going to distribute that for you. You need to make sure that's the same. That might be done, for example, through a network file system. Uh, so, okay, I think I'm going to, that's sort of the high level overview and there's lots of things we can talk about, uh, but maybe I will uh, hand it over to Alex, who I think has done a little bit of work and maybe we can hear about, you know, his the things he ran into, the challenges and thoughts. I actually haven't talked to him yet, so I'm curious to hear what, what he has to say. All right, um, so I'll start sharing my slides. All right. Great. So yes, this is going to be my um, overview, a user's perspective of of Dask, having worked with it only for a couple of days. So I'm I'm hoping I I can uh, give you a good idea of of what a, you should expect a physicist to see after a couple of days. Um, I've geared this talk sort of in between, you know, physicists and computer scientists, um, as I didn't know what the audience would be. Um, and please ask me if you have any questions about my uh, experience. So, um, the problem. So, th so I've been working for uh, several months um, on a machine learning problem having to do with jets. So for the physicists out there, you already know what I'm about to say. And um, for the computer scientists out there, what I'm talking about is just an object that we see in our detector that we, mu uh, we must correct for. Now we have this, this image on the right-hand side. You can see all these lines coming out of the center. Those are going to be the constituents of an object we call a jet. And so those red lines boxing that thing in is a collective uh, object, right? Um, we don't measure that object uh, perfectly for a variety of reasons, and so we derive something called a jet energy correction um, in order to uh, correct for that. 
Um, and we have several layers I'm gonna, uh, of these corrections, and I'm going to focus on one of them being the Monte Carlo truth uh, generation correction. So that's all. That's for the physicists out there. This is the problem: is to come up with the jet energy corrections uh, in, uh, using machine learning, as opposed to what we typically do, which is uh, to do a lot of fits, a parameterized set of jet energy corrections, and we parameterize these usually. Um, uh, I think there's a, a note in the video message. Um, can everyone see the slides I'm sharing? So I can yeah, see. Yeah, I can see them. Yeah, sorry, that was my fault. I'm just not familiar with this system. I'm only seeing the the meeting room at CERN. Is there a button no. somewhere to press? There's a sort of a iMac looking thing with this sort of green box to the right and above it. Um, which says toggle conference shares. Is that green? Never mind. I, I don't need to interrupt people. Go ahead. And wait, I'll, wait. I'll, so I'll so fir first, you, first you have to use your mouse and hover over the picture you see. Then a menu bar should appear in the lower part of the, win of the uh, video window. Yeah, that's the other trick. The, the that's okay. I'll, fi I'll, I'll figure it out. I don't need to interrupt things. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, yes, so we parameterize these gender energy corrections in um, two quantities, PT and ADA. Um, for the computer scientists, that's, it's not important what these are, but they're two parameter fits. Um, and we can, we can draw, basically, the, the top um, drawings are this jet energy correction versus uh, each of the two variables, and the bottom ones are just uh, the drawings of those two variables. And then we can try something uh, a little simpler. We could do a regression uh, on, on these variables to get the jet energy corrections, and that works pretty well. Um, but we, uh, it's a very simple random forest that we tried with scikit-learn um, uh, with just optimi optimization on the max depth, and we can get pretty good jet energy corrections. But we think we can do better. Um, this is no better than the parameterized corrections we already do. Uh, so the motivation was to take uh, a jet image, a two-dimensional fixed representation of the radiation pattern inside the jet. So already we've added more information to, uh, to the problem. So instead of just taking two quantities of the, constitu uh, of, the, um, of the whole object, we can take all of the constituents and look at, uh, and look at them as well as those original two quantities. So we have more granulate. Uh, granular information, and we still use those global parameters, and we want to train a network um, to learn this response, to learn what corrections need to, uh, we need to apply to the jets such that we've measured them accurately. So what you see in these image, images uh, on, the, on the top, you have the jet image, or the, the uh, picture of the detector that I showed before, and on, to the right of it is a jet image. So in um, our coordinate space, you can see um, the jet, and the colors represent the PTs of the constituents inside of that jet. And no, no two jets are gonna are gonna be exactly alike. And then you can take on the bottom. You see we can take one of those jet images and train a convolutional neural network to learn the response. Now this is these are just um, pictures. For example, that's not actually uh, the response for training it. This is from some uh, a previous paper. But uh, that's the goal. Uh, and then to do this, we're making use of the CMS open data. So there, um, this is public data that's out there. Um, the data that we're using is from 2012. Um, actually, it's a Monte Carlo sample. We're using QCD, so it's just pretty much jets. Uh, um, so we get exactly what we want. We're not using, we're not including any pileup, which means we have a very, very clean set of jets. Um, and actually, this is a, a much bigger problem th um, or data set than we were using before. Before, we were using the open data from 2011, which, is, uh, as a lot of you know, is much smaller. So we have 10 million events. Um, and inside of that, we have a huge number of jets. And then if you consider the fact that each jet has many, many constituents, this is a lot of rows in our NumPy arrays and our pandas data frames because we have to store uh, information for each one of those 
constituents. Plus, remember, uh, if you want to store all of that information in a table-like format, you're sort of duplicating the JET information over and over again. And eventually, you have to clean that out. So I've put a link in here to the data set that we're using in case anyone wants to take a look at it. Uh, and our current workflow is we start with this one terabyte data set with 340 files. They're in, a, in root and AOD format. This is what um, comes out of, this is what CMS has created for our, our standard data formats. And then we're using a, a, a C to NumPy library to convert, the, uh, convert these, uh, a selection of this data into a NumPy format. And this comes out with 108 files of roughly one gigabyte. Now, if you just add that up, you can see very clearly this is not going to fit into memory. Uh, so in other words, we cannot send our entire uh, data set to the GPU. We, can't, we just can't fit it in memory. So the first thing we do is we process these in batches. So we load in uh, these NumPy arrays and turn them into two different pandas data, data frame objects. Um, now, it's important that there's two. So one is going to store just the JET information, and that's what you see at the top. So we've, we've cleaned out all of those duplicates coming from the, the constituents. And then on the bottom, you see a bunch of constituents from that first JET. So we have a second data frame which just stores the constituents. And you can see the differences in the lengths of these two. So there's 80, in one file, remember this is just one file, there are 85,844 JETs but you can see there's two and a half million constituents. So this is really um, going to become a, a big chunking problem. Um, and then after uh, we've turned these into data frames, we build these JET images. We in insert them into a new data frame, and we pickle that whole thing up because we have to save it because we can't look, keep all of this in memory. Uh, we can load this smaller pickle file into, uh, into a separate program and send that off to Keras and TensorFlow. Now, the reason um, you know, DAS came up for us was, can we cut out needing to do this in batches? So can we reduce our memory footprint? And can we send all of this information to the GPU efficiently? So, um, and can we do it faster is the other thing. Because um, right now it's taking us a, a long time to process all of this. So with DASC, and this is just you know, after a couple of days of working with it, I'm sure I, there is I can, I, we can improve this program a lot. Uh, the first uh, two steps are pretty much the same, but then I realized it was much easier to work with H5Pi files than it was NumPy files. Uh, I wish there was a C2H5Pi library. Um, it, as it stands, the way I did it is I just converted a bunch of our files, NumPy files, to, to H5Pi. Um, I tried a different method of using Dask delayed. Um, Open, loading NumPy files, but load by, you know, and loading a NumPy file by its very nature loads it into memory, and I just couldn't get this method to work. Um, once I have, uh, once I can, I open, I, I have these files, I can form a Dask data frame uh, with these H5Py files on, on, in disk arrays. Uh, so I haven't actually loaded anything into memory yet until I tell it to build these images. Um, and then I can do exactly what I was doing before and save the, the pickle file of the jet images. The additional thing that I, that I figured out was that I could use uh, the Dask client to make, to sort of turn our really big uh, login nodes into a, a mini cluster. So we have these new GPU machines which have 16 cores on them. Um, and uh, so I was able to take advantage of all 16 cores to do this which, because my program is not really well parallelized yet, um, is quite advantageous. Um, all right. So the problems that I encountered was, first, we were, were working with GPUs because we're doing uh, a machine learning uh, a pro, um, a project. Uh, but the uh, Dask version on the Amazon Web Services AMIs is out of date. Um, it's, it's old and does not have the functions that the documentation um, says it should. So uh, I installed Dask, a new version, on, uh, on our GPU machines. So it, currently at the LPC, we have a version, an up-to-date version of Dask, but uh, anyone who wants to do this on the AWS might run into this problem. Uh, 
I had the uh, part of the problem I had with Dask Delayed was that some of the documentation out there um, is incomplete. So uh, um, I wasn't I, I I didn't have a fully working uh, example until just now uh, to look at Dask Delayed. Uh, so I want to I'm definitely going to look back at that and try and get that to work. Um, and then. The other thing for, for the way physicists think, we, op we often use positional, uh, position dependent indexing um, because everything's loaded into memory and uh, we can just go directly to say the jet we want or the constituent we want. But if not everything is loaded into memory, as I'm finding out, that's a, that's a costly process. So I realized in doing this that I have to think of a new way of creating these jet images, not just jumping around in my data frame to the to the objects that I want. Um, so there's these group by functions, which I think uh, might be very useful, and I'm gonna de definitely take a, another look at that. Uh, sort of a more Pythonic way of doing things. So in summary, uh, we're just beginning to understand the scope of our project, how to get all this information, process all the information, and get it, in, uh, get it to where it needs to go, namely the GPU. Um, and, and on, on top of this uh, sort of big data problem, I guess, you have CMS open data, which presents its own problems and own challenges. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, we're not allowed to use, uh, or we're, where, you know, where do we store these things? How do, we, you know, where do we process them? Um, and then also, you know, as a physicist, I need to think more like a computer scientist. I need to make sure that I have optimized my code or parallelized it correctly. Um, so, uh, I can make full use of the data in the correct way and, and improve the accuracy of our training. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'll uh, respond a couple things on that, which is I think it was a really good actually example for a few reasons. Um, uh, so I think that a couple cool things came out. Uh, first, it sounded like you had already, in your first part of your competition, talking about using DAS delayed, you're already doing things, things in batches. It sounds like you have already sort of figured out how to, you know, paralyze or how to break up your competition into lots of smaller pieces. You've already done sort of some of the, some of the work. Um, and that's, that's pretty common. And then, you know, maybe DASK, so it sounds like, you know, the first part of DASK, creating task graphs, not that actually that useful for you. You just need to, um, you, know, you just want DAS to run those computations for you. Um, in the second part of the computation, you're talking about you know problems with DAS data frame, documentation, uh, being surprised about how performance has changed, right? The, while DAS data frame may provide the same API as pandas or DAS array as NumPy, the performance characteristics uh, are, are quite different sometimes. Your random access is actually quite a bit harder in distributed memory than it is locally. Uh, you should also look at more documentation. Random access is possible if you start doing some more work. Again, so if you can store your data with some information about where, you know, where each chunk lives, Dask data frame can take care of that and, and use things like random access. But again, there's more work. So uh, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, any of these libraries like Dask, uh, when they uh, promise something like, oh, it looks just like pandas, but it's actually with a lot of little caveats. And there often is some nuance involved to getting it to work, you know, as, as you would like. Um, for us with these tabular sorts of data, these group by functions seem to be useful. Um, and I saw that you, you had, you showed one really quickly on one of your slides, but can you explain sort of the usefulness of those? I, th I think that's, that's um, I was thinking about the problem of, say you wanted to get all the constituents for a given jet, and you've already, you already store which jet is, um, these constituents belong to somewhere in your table. So you want to group those and sort of form a, 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 you know, a, a new data frame or you want to you wanna pull that information out. Yeah, so this gets into sort of just generally how, how pandas might work, um, or generally how like SQL works, right? I've got a bunch of records, they have relations to each other. Um, how do I, how do I take advantage of those relations and, and build up some, some, complex, comp, some complex query? I want, you know, all of the, um, all of the events where, you know, some X particle hits some Y particle, uh, and also, 
exactly what those particles masses are. Maybe the masses are stored somewhere else. I'm, I don't know your field that I'm sort of guessing. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, the cluster has increased in size. So let's take a look at group by stuff again. Uh, let's just take a, a moment to load. So again, we're loading all of our CSV data. Um, so we might look at our data frame and we might do something like, I want to group by maybe the passenger count. So I want all the rides with one passenger, all the rides with two passengers, all the rides with three passengers. And look at maybe the, the trip distance and maybe the mean of that trip distance. Uh, so this tells us things like, you know, single passenger rides seem to be the longest. Maybe this is, you know, rides to the airport. Uh, you know, two passenger rides are also fairly long, but a little bit shorter. When you got three people in the car, it's actually, you're probably not going very far. Um, you see also some interesting, you know, there are some odd rides with zero passengers. So um, some of these groupings, you know, so in this case, we're computing the average over all these different groups. That's something that you can sort of paralyze in a clever way. You can compute sort of the average of all different groups, maybe average those averages in some interesting way to get that result out. If you're doing something more complex, it might be harder, right? So uh, my, my records here uh, are not organized by passenger count. It's not the case that all of the single ride passengers on one machine are on a bunch of different machines. And that's why we're seeing some communication. We're seeing a fair amount of red over here on the right. So when you're doing these things that require moving data between, you know, uh, require coordinating events across many different data sources, uh, you start running into situations where you're caring a lot about, about a lot about performance and, and locality. Um, what we often find is that it makes sense to, um, to rearrange or index your data in some way. So here they're organized sort of by no particular organization. The index here on the left is just some numeric index, uh, but we might spend a little bit of time to first sort our data. Um, so this is going to sort our data by the, the pickup date time, uh, and that will allow for uh, some faster operations. So this is an expensive thing. Uh, sorting in parallel across the cluster is, is hard. Uh, you can see there's, you know, tens of thousands of little Python functions to, to make this thing happen. Uh, but the, the result, uh, once we do this, this expensive process, it looks like it's going to take sort of tens of seconds. Uh, the result of that, though, is that now we have uh, a nice, our data is nicely arranged. And so we can do things like get, um, you know, data for the particular day, maybe, you know, May 5th. Uh, and that's going to happen very, very fast because now we know exactly where it is. We can do random access. Right, so we grab some amount of data in about a second, and we only had to do a couple of computations in order to get that data. It was like it was spread across two different pandas data frames in our cluster. So data access patterns are something you need to start thinking about when you switch to a, a distributed computation. You have to be clever and use things like group by on uh, generic aggregations like mean, sum, count. Or if you have more complex code, as I suspect you guys do, uh, you might need to think about uh, rearranging your data ahead of time. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it, it does. We don't tend, I mean, like you said, we don't tend to do, you know, things like mean, but, you know, my problem was more specifically, it was, you know, do a group by and then take that and turn it into a NumPy hist2d, right? So. Yeah, so you can do things like group by, you know, I could have grouped by passenger count, like I did before. Uh, then I could have called the apply function. And this apply function takes uh, some other function, uh, which is, you know, uh, takes in one pandas data frame and then returns some other pandas data frame or some numpy array or, or whatever you like. And we can apply that. Uh, however, this will be, uh, this will require the same kind of, of cost that we saw here. That we're moving all the data around so that all of the records of a particular type of event can be on one machine at the same time. Mm. But there, there's some cost to doing distributed computation when your records need to move around. Right. But it's probably still faster than searching around your 
out of memory array, correct? Uh, it, it, that could very well be the case, but things can be quite different. Uh, I hesitate to make any claim on performance uh, before we sort of see right. more. Things get weird. So. Got it. Okay, are there other more general questions? Yes, uh, so, sorry, he is Peramato. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Perhaps you said, but it was not, uh, not clear to me. The mm -hmm. workers, um, do they exploit the, all the cores that you have on each worker automatically, or you have to do something special? Uh, yeah, by default they will, although you can, uh, you can always uh, control that if you want. Here, let me and bring up. The, the exploitation of these cores is done by threads or is done by multiprocess? Uh, by default, it's by threads. If you want to have multiple processes, you would just start many DAS workers on the same machine. Uh, but by default, we find that most numeric code uh, does well in Python with many threads. And then the second question is, do you have a mechanism by which you can transfer part of the state of the master to the workers? I mean, I know that in, 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 uh, in systems like PP or uh, you, you, can, you can say to the workers, okay, these are the modules I'm using, or these are the Python objects I am carrying, and you can carry to the workers some part of the state. Do you have something like this, or? I'm not sure I entirely understand your question. I'll try to answer it, but please tell me if I'm not getting it right. Uh, so task workers, by default, will hold on to the data. Um, so when they compute some, some results, with some, some function, they hold on to that data until some other worker needs it, and then they'll communicate peer to peer. Uh, generally, the scheduler doesn't hold on to any data. Uh, that would be, uh, usually it's, it's too much data to put onto one single machine. Now, if you're talking about moving around, uh, you know, software modules, libraries, et cetera, yeah. there, are, there are mechanisms to move around binaries, to, you know, move files between the different workers if you happen to have some, uh, some code that's lying around. Um, but, uh, but generally... But, but imagine the following case. Imagine that you have a Python object that uh, describes the configuration parameters that your calculation will need afterwards. I mean, you could set up that in, in, in the local thing and then carry that as an argument. Yeah, that's, that's totally fine. And when we... Yeah, so if you, um, if you place any object you know, maybe it's some function, maybe it depends on some, some extra data. Um, so like this, I might have defined some, some code locally, yeah. and I might want to uh, send that to some other worker as part of my computation here. So maybe I'm calling, you know, um, yeah. So uh, we use something called Cloud Pickle to do that. So Cloud Pickle uh, and that will help us uh, serialize uh, that function uh, and, and so, that we, so that we can send it over to other workers. So you can use, like for example, the functions I made in this example here with increment, decrement, and add. Yeah, this is serialized, okay. Yeah, so they were all sent over automatically. And if they have references to, if they have references to local objects, they get also serialized. I, assuming those can be serialized. So okay. a counterexample here would be, you know, you wouldn't want to do this. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't refer to a lock because that's going to be something that, that Python will not want to serialize okay. uh, with good reason, right? That lock is not, okay. Uh, okay. Is not nice to do. So we have, you know, other, uh, other variants for that. Okay, thanks. I think Jim had a question going back to what we were talking about before with the group buys. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a way to tell Dask that you know, if you've already sorted your information a certain way, to tell it it is sorted already, uh, so it doesn't need to look everywhere, it just need, you know, needs to find the first instance of the thing you're looking for, the group buy that you're looking for? Yeah, so actually when you, um, when you, so the, the pandas abstraction that there is one sorted index, there's one sorted column. In this case, we set it to be the, the pickup date time. Um, and when you, when you call set index, uh, you're saying, hey, you know, please sort my data by this thing, by you know, my column. Uh, that actually has a sorted 
um, a sorted art, uh, keyword argument. So you can say, please sort it by this thing. And by the way, it's already sorted. Uh, I believe actually this, this will check automatically uh, when it's going through and doing the sorting at like first as a single pass and it collects all the information during that single pass. It also checks, hey, is the thing I'm about to sort by, is that already sorted? If so, it's, it's done. So, yeah. Okay, There's, good. So we can save ourselves a little bit of computing there. Yeah, he was, he was pointing out that a, a lot of these constituents come from jets already, so they're already sorted in, into this order that we want by construction. Yeah, and so that, that would be great. Uh, I might also recommend using data formats, storing it in data formats that can, um, that can track that, that metadata. Uh, so these days we tend to recommend Parquet uh, as a nice data format, and you can place all that information to Parquet so that when DAS data frame loads that data set, it will say, oh, there's already a sorted column here. This is the thing they want to be the index, and everything ends up being, being quite nice. Mm. Okay. You guys may have other requirements. I know historically you guys have had different, uh, different data formats, different everything, but Parquet is, is quite a nice file format. It's very friendly in both C++ and in Python and many other languages. Uh, it can store a variety of complex data types. Yeah, and Not fact, as complex uh, as root, obviously. But in fact, uh, um, uh, as we de develop connectors from, from root to Dask, we can um, uh, convey that same information. Because our input data sets are usually um, like nested objects. An event that's, that contains jets and a jet that contains con constituents. So, um, this grouping yeah, is, exists by construction, and so uh, if we know that we're getting the data out of the root format, uh, we can inf make the same guarantees that, that the parquet is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a variety of ways to, uh, you know, you will make some function that turns root objects into, you know, a bunch of root stored objects into a DAS data frame. And in the construction of that function, there's plenty of documentation I can point you to online, uh, you can uh, specify, you know, the sort of the start and stop of every bit of data that you're pulling from that file. And DAS can use that information to then inform its, its computation in the future. Again, if you're using DAS data frames. There's a bunch, there's a lot to DAS other than just DAS data frames. Yeah, yeah. Uh, over the, uh, the the weekend, I went through the exercise of um, uh, making desk arrays from uh, root branches. So the root concept of a branch maps onto an array pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the the desk part of it was uh, I think two lines, and uh, the rest was uh, um, making a lazy array. Right. Other Any questions from out there? Uh, we're getting close to the end of time, so um, uh, any uh, desperate last minute questions? Or even not so desperate? <laughs> but uh, this is a good chance to, uh, uh, to ask about it now. Are there any other, you, you mentioned that Dask is a, is a, has a lot of components to it. Are there any other components uh, besides, you know, data frame and array and, and delay that you think might be useful to, to this group of people? Um, yeah, or that a, you'd like to point out? Yeah, that's a great question. And maybe to, it's a good segue to point you to documentation. So you mentioned documentation was incomplete. There are many blog posts and things people have written about a bunch of times in other places around the world. Um, for example, you noticed the AWS image was, was very, very old. Uh, the, the source of truth for Dask is at dask.pydata.org. And uh, this is fairly complete and fairly up to date. Uh, so there's things we talk about arrays, data frames, delayed. You may also consider bags. This is just a, a linear sequence of Python objects without any sort of frills. It's a very simple object. There's futures. This is a more real-time system, so you can uh, submit computations, wait on some of them, cancel others, submit more while they're happening. It's much more dynamic. Uh, it's similar to delayed in how flexible it is, but it's a little bit more, uh, a little more real-time. There's also libraries for things like machine learning, 
And that was also just thinking about task graphs at a very low level. Uh, if you're just learning more, I'm going to point people to uh, mybinder.org. I put again, I put a link in the, the chat window. But if you go to this page, uh, it will launch for you uh, your very own small instance running Dask. And there'll be some examples there similar to what we've seen here, but you can play with them uh, on your own. Um, so it'll allow you to explore, uh, change things, break things um, from the safety of someone's Docker container on the cloud. So if people are interested, I recommend going to that. It's a, a simple way to try out Dask, you know, under lunch break sometime. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming and, and talking with us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And thank you, Alex, for sharing your experiences as well. My pleasure.